Okay. All right, so uh, beneficial insects and mites in the orchard. Um, about 1% of all the insects that occur in the world uh, could be considered a pest. And um, about 80% um, of insects can be predators or parasitoids on those pest insects. Last week I talked a lot about monitoring, getting out in the orchard, and looking for pests, and it's so important. Um, you're gonna learn about these beneficials now to watch for them as well in the orchard, because that's, again, gonna help you make decisions on if you need to intervene on the, the pests that you're seeing. So types of natural enemies in terms of uh, insects or even fungi, um, there's predators. So those are insects that need to feed on their prey and they may feed on multiple uh, variety of prey. And then there's parasitoids that require a host insect to uh, complete their life cycle. There are also several other uh, organisms that kill and target insects. There's fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes. Uh, but I'm just going to talk about some predators and parasitoids. That um, picture you're seeing on the bottom is a borer that's been killed by a fungus. All right, who can recognize what this is? I'm sure someone, uh, this looks kind of like a lady beetle-ish. So it's a pupil case of lady beetles. And when you ask someone, okay, name a beneficial insect, lady beetles is gonna probably be what the first thing they're gonna think of. But there's so many different species. Um, and the great thing about the lady beetles is that both the adults and their young, the larvae, feed on the prey. They're both predaceous. So in their lifetime, they can certainly feed on a lot of uh, prey, and aphids is probably the, the most common uh, prey, but they're gonna feed on scale crawlers, spider mites, really so those soft-bodied insects. And uh, so they're gonna be found wherever the prey occurs. Um, some adult lady beetles will also feed on pollen and nectar, but for the most part, they're, they're targeting where their prey is. And one of the most common species that actually I've seen is the uh, introduced or non-native multi-colored uh, Asian lady beetle. And it occurs in all different colors from yellow to red and with a variety of different spots on their backs. Um, but they're recognized by uh, the letter M shape on that white area of the elytra on their backs. So some, in some cases a little faint but when you see that letter M, that's the multicolored Asian lady beetle. And so the bad thing about this one is they're kind of pushing out the native species. Another lady beetle relative, Diane had mentioned this one, Stathoris. It's, I've actually seen this a lot in some orchards. Um, they'll feed on the small areophyid mites, but also spider mites as well. So this is an important, very tiny uh, lady beetle that we can, uh, lady beetle relative that we can see in the orchards. So the lady beetles, they overwinter as adults in protected sites and they'll come out pretty early and seek out their prey and lay their eggs in these clusters of, of bright yellow eggs. And I'll usually see them on the undersides of the leaves, but uh, they can be on, on the fruit itself, wherever they know there's prey nearby. Uh, so the adults can lay anywhere up to 200 eggs or so, and uh, they'll live for about three months. So in the, the top left corner, that's some larvae that have just hatched out of their eggs, and they'll disperse immediately, seeking out food. And so like there's several species of the adults, the larvae are also going to look a lot different depending on the species that they are. The lower left is the most common um, lady beetle larva that you might see. And so here's that pupal case I showed you in the, in the earlier slide. So they'll pupate wherever they can find a spot and again emerge as an adult. Uh, so lady beetles and a lot of predators, about 80% of them, feed by, they capture their prey and then they inject these digestive enzymes into the body of the prey and they could just suck the contents out. 
So it's like they're pre-digesting their food and it allows them, these tiny little predators, to feed on another uh, insect that's even larger than they are or maybe the same size. If you can imagine, you know, us doing the same thing, it might not be so easy. All right, anyone recognize what these are? They're eggs, right? Lacewing eggs, yes. All right, so lacewings, another very important uh, predator that we can find in the orchards. Diane mentioned we have green lacewing and brown lacewing. What's different about the lacewings is that the adults typically only feed on pollen and nectar. They're not predaceous. It's their young, the larvae that are. And they feed on the same uh, soft-bodied insects that the, the uh, lady beetles do, aphids being most common. And you also don't often see the lacewings because they are active at night. So they're visiting flowers at night, again, look, seeking out pollen and nectar for food, um, and then looking for places in which to lay their eggs. So on the left photo shows a few sparse eggs. That's um, the brown lacewing seems to lay single eggs, and the green lacewing will lay those clusters of eggs. And the predators can find these colonies of aphids through um, volatiles that plants may give off when they're being fed upon or the honeydew from the actual aphids themselves. So if you're wondering how are they actually finding where to lay these eggs, there is that chemical communication going on. Uh, so the adults overwinter um, in protected sites, emerge and lay their eggs, and like the lady beetles, they can live a fairly long time. But with both of these, there's multiple generations. Um, some people refer to the lacewing larvae as the alligators of the insect world because they sort of have that shape. And here's one um, a single lacewing on this leaf full of aphids just munching its way through. So it can eat about 400 or so aphids in its lifetime. And so they don't find their prey by looking. They have to sense and feel. And uh, it grabs the prey with this, the sickle-shaped mandibles, and again, injects that salivary secretion and, um, and, and sucks up the contents. And as soon as it's done eating, they'll just move right along to their next uh, prey. So very voracious and very beneficial uh, predator in the orchard. All right, so surfid flies or hoverflies. This is one that you may not, Diane mentioned this a lot as a, a great uh, beneficial, but you may not really be familiar with it or even know that you're seeing it within a colony of aphids. It kind of blends in. Um, but here's one munching its way through some uh, woolly apple aphids, and it's kind of a nice green color, but they can also be sort of a yellowish color, but typically the olive um, color that, again, blends in with the aphids is the one that uh, is most commonly seen. So they have the same diet as the lady beetles and lacewings, the aphids, mites, scale crawlers. Um, but the adults, like the lacewing, they're not predaceous. So they need the flowers. They need the pollen and the nectar in order to survive and mate and lay their eggs. So here are some adult hoverflies. And you can see the one on the top there that um, has emerged very early. They overwinter as pupae in the soil or in protected areas. And that has emerged even before the leaves have started coming out. So they're right away, early spring, looking for uh, their prey. And they sort of look like bees, but they're flies. So bees have two sets of wings and flies just have one set of wings. And these are a lot smaller. And you probably have seen them. They fly, they're called hoverflies for a reason, because they tend to fly kind of in a flat um, style where they're just kind of seeking out the flowers and, and looking, whereas, you know, the bees are a little bit more, uh, have a little bit more movement. Uh, so let's see, they uh, live for about a month or so, but there's multiple, multiple generations of um, the surfid flies. And here's a picture of an egg. It's a a little smaller than a grain of rice, but it's that white chalky color. And when the, the surfid flies encounter aphid colonies, the honeydew that they produce actually stimulates the female to lay more and more eggs. So that leaf on the left 
just covered with, that's mealy plum aphid. Um, I get a lot of these pictures at my house. <laughs> I like to let the insects do their thing. Um, the, the picture on the right has a few serpent flies on it that is really, you know, taking care of that aphid population. So they're like the lace wings in, the, in that they can eat four to 600 aphids uh, in their lifetime. All right, so the minute pirate bug is kind of um, unsung hero or a workhorse in the orchard, but it's so tiny, its name minute, um, that we really don't see it that much. It's um, this small black insect, and um, both the adults and the young are predaceous, and it's one of the more important predators of uh, spider mites and thrips in the orchard. This is another one where the adults, it also needs pollen to, again, help it with mating and egg laying. And typically you're not going to see it. Again, like I said, they're so small and they usually occur on the undersides of the leaves. Again, that's where a lot of the prey is going to be. So here's a, a nymph of the minute pirate bug. Um, it, incomplete metamorphosis, so they're not larvae, they're nymphs. They're just developing their wings. So this one is just finished feeding on a spider mite. Uh, and the adult lays its eggs inside the leaf tissue. So you'll never see the eggs. Um, they'll hatch into the nymphs, and right away they're going to go foraging for food. So this just kind of gives you an idea of their size. Uh, this a little bit of a close-up of a leaf on the right, and that circle is a, a minute pirate bug nymph. And there's an adult on the left. So when we're out there scouting using our beading trays, and Diane mentioned those today, we, we can see a lot of uh, these predators as well with that method. So that's the, the fabric there that you're seeing. Um, so they're very active hunters. They're going to constantly moving around searching for prey. This one is looking for thrips uh, on this leaf. And... They feed the same way as I've already described, where they inject the salivary toxins and then they can suck out the, the content. So they leave that the cuticle of the insect behind. And um, all these videos I'm showing, they're not mine. I just need to point out, you may have realized that uh, from the note on the screen. Um, but this person has shown the reason they backed up, just so you can see how tiny the pirate bugs on the on the leaves. So that was a micro, using a microscope to see. All right, so another predator uh, in the orchard, Dariocarus brevis, is one also we may not see so often. Um, I see this when I'm doing my beading samples here and there, and sometimes um, in the top right, feeding on some woolly uh, apple aphids. It sort of looks like a stink bug, so that's what people, when they see this, think that they have a pest, but it's, it's really a, a good beneficial. Um, for those who grow pear trees, I know there's not a lot in Utah, but this is one of the important predators of pear scylla. All right, so finally, predatory mites. And Diane's already talked about the, the western predatory mite, Gallandromus, how important it is to manage your spider mite uh, or your uh, orchard practices to prevent the spider mites from moving up in, into the tree so that the gallandromus can do their thing where the spider mites are down uh, on the ground cover. Um, so they're pear-shaped, and they're pretty easy to identify. If you're looking at a leaf with spider mites on it, you can see the predatory mites because they're going to move quickly throughout that spider mite colony, whereas the mite, the uh, pest mites, are just going to be sitting there, you know, like, like cows, not doing anything. Um, so they're pear-shaped, whereas the spider mites are, are more oval-shaped, and they don't have that uh, black two-spotted appearance, so they're easier to identify. All right, so there's a lot of other predatory insects in the orchard. Um, it's no, you know, impossible to cover them all. These are just a few other examples. Um, there are some growers that have commented a lot lately about the number of spiders and uh, spider webs that they have run through constantly in the orchard. And um, they realize that's a good thing because they are feeding on uh, a lot of the prey. And also that means that that orchard is not using a lot of pesticides, etc. So spiders are very good to have. What's that? Most people think of spider. Oh, okay. So. 
Right. So what would be the percentage of the spiders that are good or beneficial in the orchard? That's a good question. I don't know if I can answer the percentage. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah. So they would all be, yeah, they'd all be feeding on other insects. Um, but there are some that are better or more uh, effective than others. Crab spiders, hunting spiders. Um, so they're all good. All right, moving to uh, parasitoids. So parasitoids, wasps or flies, again, these are insects that need another host in which to complete their life cycle. All right, so one group of parasitoid wasps targets aphids. And what they do is they lay a single, the adult female lays a single egg within an aphid, and then the larva of that female feeds inside the aphid. The aphid's still alive while it's feeding. Um, but then when that larva is done uh, and gets ready to pupate to an adult, then the aphid dies and becomes bloated um, and a mummy. So here is, again, a single um, a, uh, female wasp, and she's laying a single egg inside each aphid she encounters. And she can lay several hundred eggs. So this one female is taking care of many aphids. And she knows which aphid she's already laid an egg in, or maybe some other wasp has laid an egg in, and she'll avoid that one and lay an egg in another one that hasn't been parasitized yet. Um, it will, of course, rain, depend on uh, the temperature. So it can be anywhere from seven days um, uh, to a few days. So, yes, unless Diane wants to... Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they'll, for the most part, within a few days, they'll stop feeding and just kind of, you know, become what we call mummies. And that's what's shown here. A lot of these uh, aphids that look bloated and tan or black in color on the top right, um, they're the ones that have been parasitized by, by the wasps. And when they have that hole cut in them, like on the lower right, that's, you know that the adult parasitoid wasp has already emerged. So you may see some of these bloated aphids that don't have that hole in it. Well, you know that the wasp is still inside, uh, so it's good to leave those in the orchard if you can. Uh, and the color of the aphid, if it turns black or tan, really depends on the species of the, of the wasp that attacked it. So Diane mentioned um, Aphelinus mali. It's a very important parasitoid of the woolly apple aphid, which is a, um, can be a serious pest. And it's certainly not one that's going to, you know, take care of the population, but you know you have it when you start to see these black mummies within the, the woolly apple, apple aphid population. Well, they didn't mention is all, all these parasitoid wasps, they, they're, the adults need pollen and nectar to survive. So that's what's going to help bring them into the orchard. All right, so there's those that target aphids, and there's wasps that target caterpillars. And they're going to be a little bit larger in size, um, so they can go after leaf rollers in the orchard. Um, codling moss, when they have started to pupate or form their cocoons, uh, peach twig borer larvae. So there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different species of parasitoid wasps. So this is not an orchard pest. It's just a general caterpillar that has been parasitized by, I don't know, 60 to 100 uh, larvae inside its body. So we're now looking inside the caterpillar, and these are the parasitoid wasps feeding. And in the meantime, the caterpillar is still alive. It's still doing its thing. Because um, if it died, then these wouldn't be able to complete their life cycle. So here it's still feeding, uh, oblivious of what's going on inside. But now they're done. They're ready to pupate. So they're not going to pupate inside the caterpillar. They're going to emerge through the caterpillar's skin. <laughs> and this is what really kills the caterpillar. Um, and then they'll, they'll pupate. And you can see that uh, they'll emerge and lay eggs on more. So in this case, some of these wasps have. Um, uh, the capacity where their larvae feeds on the outside of the, um, their host. So in the top picture, all those smaller uh, larvae on the borer are wasp 
um, larvae, and that's an uh, ectoparasite. And when they feed on the inside, it's an endoparasite. Yes, that's raspberry horntail. <laughs> Uh, and then there's teeny, teeny, tiny um, parasitic wasps that just target eggs of other insects. And those are also, again, unseen often, but doing a, a really great job. There's ones that on the far left that target stink bug eggs. On the lower left, um, just a general egg parasitoid, trichogramma. And the middle picture is the uh, new non-native parasitoid that's been discovered in Pacific Northwest against brown marmorated stink bug, the Trisulcus japonicus. And I believe you mentioned that um, Diane has a student that's gonna be looking for this parasitoid in Utah. And then on the lower right is one that just targets codling moth eggs, the Ascogaster. And when the eggs are parasito parasitized, they turn uh, black. All right, so finally, I just want uh, to say a few comments on promoting and preserving the beneficials in the orchard. You certainly won't want to look at just this natural biocontrol as taking care of all pests, but there are ways to promote them and help them to do their thing. So you're learning about them. So when you're out there monitoring, look for them. Be able to recognize the difference between the, the pests and the beneficials. And it's also important to understand that they need food. So keeping a low population of prey uh, available that they can feed on is important. Um, Diane mentioned for, spider, uh, for the predatory mite, Gallandromus, that um, spider mites may not be active when they're ready to start feeding in early spring. And so rust mites are a great food source for, for the predatory mite, but they really don't harm the tree. And so leaving the rust mites in the orchard. And then, of course, there's no question that um, you'd have to Im implement a treatment when, uh, when it's time. But it, there's a lot of options of treatments you can choose from. And so trying to pick the one that's going to be the least toxic to maybe some of these beneficials. So the website, intermountainfruit.org, there is a table on that site that does list every product that we recommend and its toxicity to pollinators and to a lot of these beneficials I mentioned. So on that table, one star would be a pretty non-toxic product and four stars would be um, something you might want to avoid if you can. And then you could take it one step further and try and bring these beneficials into your orchard or conserve them. And a lot of them I said, I kept repeating, is that they, uh, the adults feed on pollen and nectar. Some of them need that to be able to lay eggs and mate. So there's been a lot of research on how this can be done. Um, Michigan State University did a small project just looking at the flowers and you know what's the percentage of different beneficials that are actually visiting the flowers. And so we have um, some examples here, like the, the minute uh, pirate bug was one of the most common, 30% of, of all the, the insects they saw. Um, but the, uh, on the left, chalcids, parasitoid wasps, also very important. So we know that they're coming to the flowers, they need the, the, um, that pollen and nectar to, to survive. And so there's been many studies, as I said, on ways to um, promote that in the orchard. Diane mentioned last week, um, was it last week or this week? <laughs> Today, <laughs> that um, the use of alyssum, which is a small annual, um, with tiny flowers, in row, um, the alleyway actually, can actually bring in surfeit flies. And this was a project out of Washington State University. They first looked at a bunch of different flowers, what would be the best, De decided on alyssum for the orchard, and then looked at what are the, ins uh, the beneficials coming to the alyssum, found a lot. Um, surfeit fly was the most common. And then they were able to tell that the surfeit flies were actually moving into the orchard as well. Um, so this was a good example of, of a positive way to promote um, aphid biocontrol. And then there's also been some studies looking at um, supplementing plantings around the orchard uh, with other plants, again, flowering plants. And I know that this is uh, maybe not practical in all cases because it requires space, um, it requires water for some plants, and also, of course, your time to 
take care of them a little bit. Um, but University of California Davis and um, Berkeley have done some uh, observations and plantings. And uh, so they did this hedgerow study where uh, they planted the hedgerows and they looked at over 10,000 insects within the hedgerows. So one of the things that they found was what's the comparison of the pests to the beneficials within those hedgerows. And throughout the season, beneficials far outweighed the pests, okay? And then I also wanted to know, um, well, what would be the difference between the native plantings and the weeds in terms of pests and beneficials? So that's what's shown on the right. The uh, lighter colored orange is the beneficials and the darker is the pests. So this is showing that on the, on the native grasses, it's about the same with um, pests and beneficials, but on the weeds, the pests far outweighed uh, the beneficial insects. All right, so they found a lot of insects, and like I mentioned with the Elysium study, they were able to um, tell where were these insects going. They sprayed a, a protein marker on the actual, the whole hedgerow, and that got on the insects, and they could find these insects in the orchard later. And on average, they were moving about 100 feet into the orchard, and some were moving 250 feet or more into the, the orchard. So another uh, successful example of this conservation biological control could be on what it's called. Yes, yeah. So there's lots of literature on maybe what she was asking, what are the plants that might be most effective for this? Um, just in general, it's the flowers that are very small because a lot of these insects are tiny. Um, but there's lots of literature. Uh, there's this book, Farming with Native Beneficial Insects, that lists uh, examples of some of these plants that can be used. So these, what I'm showing here, are just a, a few things that you can go online to look and see and get more info. Because this would be a whole other session to talk more about that. All right, so does anyone have any questions? Anything come through chat? No. Okay. So if there's no other questions, then uh, we'll go ahead and end this session.